This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. I'm very honoured and proud to introduce Ana Luisa Amaral, who is Associate Professor in the Department for Anglo-American Studies at the University of Porto. She has a PhD on the poetry of Emily Dickinson and has published widely in the areas of English and American poetry, comparative poetics, and feminist studies. Indeed, she has been involved in some of the most significant publications in feminist studies in Portugal in the last few years. For example, an influential theoretical study on women's writing, published in 1997, the Dictionary of Feminist Criticism in 2005, and an annotated edition of the classic revolutionary New Portuguese Letters. As well as being a hardworking academic and an inspirational teacher, she has also published 13 books of poetry, three books for children, a play, translations of, among others, John Updike and Emily Dickinson, and her first novel, Ara, has just come out, I think, last week. Yes. So congratulations for that. Uh, her work has been awarded numerous prizes and accolades, such as the Premio di Poesia Giuseppe Acerbi in 2007, and the Grand Prize of the Portuguese Writers Association in 2008. And she's been published in Brazil, Sweden, the Netherlands, France, Italy, Venezuela, and Colombia and hopefully soon in the UK. Ana Luisa participated in the launch event for the Centre for for the Study of Contemporary Women's Writing, CCWW, which took place here at Senate House in 2009, with a marvellous poetry reading and discussion of her work under the theme of Writing Childhood, which is still available as a podcast from the Centre's website. Today, however, Uh, She's speaking from another position, that of poet-mother or mother-poet. The parallel themes of motherhood and literary creation are paramount within (coughs) Ana Luisa's poems, which meditate on the challenges of of both bringing up a daughter and engendering verses. They combine, her poems combine intricate intertextual references to Shakespeare, Sappho, Dante, the great Portuguese poets Camões and Pessoa, with everyday elements and settings, as we can see from the title of her talk today, Poetry and Potatoes, although it could have um, just as well been onions, peas, tigers. (laughs) And my favourite poem of hers, which we may not have time to hear, Lugares Comuns, Common Places, is set in a takeaway cafe in London um, and concerns female solidarity over cups of tea and fried breakfasts. And her, her work is concerned with the legacy that women poets will pass down to their daughters, considering how poetry will develop into the future, <coughs> making sure that women's voices will be heard challenging the male-dominated literary tradition of the past. It truly is a great pleasure to introduce to you our first keynote speaker of the conference, Ana Luisa Amaral. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. I would like to start to thank Jill Rye for the invitation, Victoria Brown, the committee, Uh, for having invited me. It's the second time that I am here, as Claire said. And I would also like to thank the wonderful presentation of Claire Williams. It's wonderful. It has been wonderful to listen to what you said about me. Thank you very much, Claire. And and I also would like to thank uh, Margaret Schul Costa, who translated most of the poems that I'm going to read, uh, my own poems. My, my, uh, My talk... My conference is divided in two parts, into two parts. The first one is called Last Will and Testament, Potatoes or Poetry, and it is a question. And the second one is called Last Will and Testament, Potatoes and Poetry. Okay. I am living by plane, and the fear of heights mixed with myself 
makes me take tranquilizers and have confused dreams. If I die, I want my daughter not to forget me, someone to sing to her even with voice of key and to offer her dreams more than a rigid schedule or a well-made bed. Please give her love and sing into things, dreaming about blue suns and shining skies instead of teaching her to do her sums and how to peel potatoes. Make her ready for life. If I die in the plane, am detached from my body and become a free atom up there in the sky. May my daughter remember me and may she later on tell her own daughter that I flew in the sky and was dazzled contentment on seeing in her house the sums all wrong and the potatoes in the bag forgotten and complete. This poem, Last Will and Testament, <clears throat> belongs to my first book, Minha Senhora de Que, My Lady of What, published in 1990. The poem speaks about genealogies and love, about motherhood and bearing witness, about integrity as legacy. Please note that the last word in Portuguese in the poem is integra, from integrity, an adjective not applied usually to potatoes. Here it was translated by complete, which unfortunately does not convey the same meaning. Still, you can't say a complete potato, it's a strange thing. But integra, I think it's a little better. The poem is also about hope for a future where domestic chores are no longer ascribed to women, where gender roles and binding norms become unnecessary. It speaks about a time when potatoes and poetry don't need to exclude each other. 1990 was the year of my divorce, and it was also the year when I went for a long period to New England, to Brown University, as a visiting scholar to work on my PhD on Emily Dickinson. I went to the United States with university leave, leaving Portugal, France, and a bitter separation, but taking my daughter with me. Yet, in fact, that poem had been written two years before in 1988, when, under a Fulbright scholarship, I was at Brown for the first time and for only three months. Rita, my daughter, was then five years old. In order to go, strange that it may seem to you, I fought a long battle within my marriage, I was still married then, because I was accused of leaving her alone, of being a bad mother. To complicate things, I was starting to work on feminist theory. Another poem of that year, titled Metamorphosis, reads, let there be light in this profane world which is my place of work, a pantry. The others were once shut up in attics, but I bustle around in the pantry, at home with ham and rice, detergents and the books. May the light enter my narrow mental attic, and may the sheets of paper I so gentle cradle change the ham into a royal coach. For someone familiar to feminist studies, as we all, are, well, we all are, it is easy to detect the underlying reference, and this is, of course, an exercise I can only do a posteriori, that is, I don't think while I am writing, now I'm going to write this or that, I'm going to say this or that, I mean, this is not thought like that, but it's after that, afterwards, I can, oh, I can do these exercises of, you know, I'm trying to reflect a little bit on what I had written, what I had written before. So, for someone familiar with feminist studies, it is easy to detect the underlying reference to a book I was then reading, *The Mad Woman in the Attic*. The others were once shut up in attics, by Gilbert and Gubar, the classic. The subversive tone is also there, mixing the biblical language, let there be light, with everyday life, and with its end where the sheets of paper evoke a child and the theme of madness is lightly brought up. Those were the days where feminist studies started to emerge in Portugal in a shy way at the academic level, still looked at as a foreign and strange subject, actually they still are a little bit, in the aftermath of the revolution of 1974 and the new constitution of 1976, which established equality between men and women before the law. Since then, major advances were made on gender and sexuality issues, or in what regarded maternity benefits, for example. But notwithstanding that constitution, and even though we had some socialist governments, the socialist agenda of the 25th of April of 1974 gradually dissolved the spirit of the law contradicted by the harsh reality of old habits reenacted 
I should tell you that, for example, domestic violence in Portugal has been climbing uh, frighteningly. I wrote a poem in which I tried to express the difficulty of articulating what I saw as a schism between domesticity, motherhood, and writing, between the power of compulsory norms and gender roles and the freedom that poetry offers. In fact, its title is Terra, in Portuguese, is Terra de Ninguém, which literally means no man's land. Strangely enough, it was another language, the English one, that allowed for the pun that enriched the meaning. The poem was titled in English, No Woman's Land. And in this poem, as if, as if in a recipe to the potatoes, onions with their multiple layers, also of meaning, were added. I say space or any recipe instead. A space in earnest or no woman's land since not enough the one conquered at the price of silences, cupboards and troubling onions. Arrhythmias of me, I built up a redoubt, but not enough. In it shrivel butterflies and dreams, and the same onions repeat in vicious circles. I say space, or any recipe in place of me. These were all poems from the beginning of the 90s. When I came back from the United States in 1993, Portugal was starting to show an immense change with the right-wing politics. Everything became more acute in the next 20 years until, as you all know, the recent announcement of the crisis, the ratings, the inclusion of new words in our vocabulary, such as troika, agency rates, or the country thrown into the trash. Forty years after the revolution that brought democracy to Portugal, the government has been enfeebling the most sensitive and apparently most useless areas such as arts, culture, and education. This is not an isolated phenomenon, also happening in other European countries, profoundly threatened by statistics and trapped in an economic model ruled by the so-called financial industries in which capital overcame labor Power evaporated into the fluid space of the virtual, becoming global, and the national policies that remained local lost their sovereignty. We are witnessing, in a sort of silenced or resigned way, the failure of the res publica idea, in other words, the social state, and the near obliteration of the human strength and power. Never before in my country or at my university have we heard about so many norms and rules and how dangerous it is to break them. In this urgency of continuously summoning norms, we run the risk of, as Adorno well knew, creating a false idea of unity and of generating violence, a word used by him regarding ethics in the context of the universal versus the individual. If an ethical norm ignores all the existing social condi conditions, then the ethos can become violence, precisely that same violence that rules and norms were meant to contain. You may ask now what this last consideration has to do with this conference, where I intend to reflect upon the relations between genealogies and motherhood, literature and its network of meanings within the world. Everything, I believe, even when it was thought as work over language, poetry was never unaffected by this question of norms and rules and the insidious ways they imposed themselves, like our poet Jorge de Sena recalled by mention in Letter to My Children on Goya's Executions, a great, wonderful poem written in 1963 during fascism in his self-exile in Brazil, that there have and I quote him, always been infinite methods for dominating, annihilating, quietly, gently, through ways, inscrutable, as they say of God's ways, end quote. In a poem of mine written in 1998, the point of departure is precisely George Sinner's poem. Both poems have an ekphrastic nature, as they both refer to Goya's painting, the 3rd of May, 1808, and the execution, execution of the Spanish villagers by the Napoleon soldiers. In my poem, the last lines recall the overwhelming emotion provoked to, by, to the viewer by the whiteness of that shirt, of that man, you may, you, you may remember that the shirt of that man who opens his arms and offers his breast to the rifles. 
It is that emotion, or again, that integrity, together with the idea of respect for differences, also the sexual ones, that I try to live as last will and testament to my daughter. But differences free from hierarchies. The cue that I mention in this poem that I'm going to read does not mean precedence, but the state of being. The title of my poem borrows from Senna's title, Light, Light Letter to My Children on Goya's Executions, but reads instead, Only a Bit of Goya, Letter to My Daughter. Do you remember saying that life was like queuing up? You were little, your hair lighter, your eyes the same, though. In the metaphor given to you by childhood, you thought of life and death, of who would come next and why, and also about the total absence of reason in that chain, dreaming itself a bundle. Tonight, a warm night bursting into June, your light hair darker, I want to tell you that life can also be a line in space, a cue in time, and that your time is coming after mine. In the manner of a man who once remembered Goya in a letter to his children, I want to tell you that life can also be, sometimes, a loaded gun, as said by a lone woman, wide as a garden. To leave you creme brulee, last will and testaments, to speak to you of bowls, that's loving you for sure, but it is also disconnecting you from life, to entrench you and myself in some fake, discontinuous and endearing line. And I want to tell you of the bonds in life, of its inhabitants beyond the air, to tell you that respect, whole and infinite, does not necessarily come after love, nor before. That lines or cues are only useful as a manner of seeing, a way of ordering our astonishment, but that parallel points are possible, mirrors beyond windows, and that all is well and good, cue or bundle, two such heads in one body, a fireless dragon or a unicorn that threatens lively flames, such as the light hair you once had grew darker, but still light, in the way your childhood metaphor fitted the poem, revealing itself so handy for talking about life, life which is still good, even without the bowls broken or intact, even if dissonant as a bundle. I don't know what you will be told in a near future, whether whoever will inhabit the spaces of life will be giant-eyed or monster-horned. Because I love you, I want for you an antidote, an elixir that would make you grow all of a sudden and fly fairy-like over the queue. But because I love you, I cannot do that. And on this warm night bursting into June, I'll tell you of the bundle and the line and of the different ways of love, all made of small sounds of wonder when what is just and human is there intertwined. Life, my daughter, can be of yet another metaphor, a tongue of fire, a white shirt, the color of a nightmare. But it can also be this bulb you gave me, blossoming now a year past, for it had the softness of earth and water and a balcony were freely to walk. I said that poetry, even when it was thought as detached from common life and seen as a laborious work from language over language, was never unaffected by the issue of norms and of rules. And even if it is, as I have defended elsewhere, the very space of possibility, it was never, in fact, divorced from the world. Poetry never stood the chance of standing outside history, Adrienne Rich wrote in a poem called North American Time. And she went on, I quote Adrienne Rich, one line typed 20 years ago can be blazed on a wall in spray paint, glorify art as detachment or torture of those we did not love but also did not want to kill. We move but our words stand, become responsible and this is verbal privilege. I fully share Adrian Rich's position and standpoint. Poetry, perhaps even more than fiction, but we could then speak about this, because it contradicts power and is, in my opinion, a counterdiction, rebuilding worlds within itself, can be an acute mechanism of resistance, an enhancement of human strength, able to reinforce an ethics and the poetics of affection. 
that does not need to conflict with the idea of a high literature, one that deals with the large and general subjects, or even with the concept of the sublime as an aesthetic quality. Yet, apparently, critics didn't and still don't seem to think so. For some reason, when George Witcher, a Dickinsonian scholar, wanted to elevate Emily Dickinson to the pantheon of the great writers, he titled his book, This Was a Poet, explaining that Dickinson was not a poetess, but a poet, whose value could be compared to the very best that Western poetic tradition had produced. And the very best was, of course, poetry written by men. Or think of Harold Bloom, who in the Western canon talked about the school of resentment, as we all remember, associating it with Marxist critical theory, including African-American studies, Marxist literary criticism, new historicist criticism, feminist criticism. Bloom contended that the school of resentment threatened the very nature of the canon and might lead to its eventual demise. Bloom echoed a common concern among other reputable critics that at worst the literary tradition could be at risk of being lost or at best of being tarnished by the inclusion of what had been until just over half a century considered minor or marginal, as in life and today are considered minor or marginal, the migrants, the landless, the homeless, those inhabiting the line of poverty or living even below it, those suffering from the plague of war, and among those, and more acutely, we all know, women. We only need to remind ourselves that 78% of the Syrian refugees, who are expected to be three and a half million by next December, are women and girls, 78% are women and girls, and children, women and their children, or women and orphans of war. It is, therefore, about dominant ideologies that we talk about. Either we speak of life or of writing. Shouldn't we worry, then, about an idea of literature concerned with the patriarchal structure of privileges and oppressions, aware of the different ways in which sexual inequality is projected, like other inequalities, in the symbolic forms of the poetic phenomenon. If literature, perceived in abstract as a possibility, does not exclude nor discriminate, specialization, that is science, aesthetics, theory, in its turn, has done so. To discuss the existence of a woman's writing, or even writing as a woman, or writing as a mother, would then turn out to be an absolutely useless task, but, concurrently, an extremely relevant one. Because to assume that the literary tradition is beyond sex, or that it is, according to those who write it, read it, and validate it, neutral, is a fallacy. If we take into account the homological and patriarchal culture that is inevitably sexed from the beginning. However, if it is true that to deny the distinction between a male poet and a female poet beyond the zero point of the asexual dystopia of the first invention is to deny a sexual differentiation, socially created, of course, that made problematic the totalizing notion of poetry as a transcendent and timeless absolute. It is also true that when it comes to poiesis, the deliberate artistic construction, the symbolic level is the one to be considered. I shall return to this question later on, but for me, there is no clear nor a definite answer to this. Second point, last will and testament, potatoes and poetry. It is a well-worn observation that women have been excluded from spheres of intellect and artistic productivity based upon the understanding of their body as an obstacle to reason and morality, faculties required for philosophic artistic competence. And it would suffice to think of Burke's, Edmund Burke's reflections on the sublime and beautiful, for example, in 1757, or of the hideous remarks on women by Schopenhauer in 1851. When the law, he wrote, conceded women equal rights with men, it should at the same time have endowed them with masculine reasoning powers. Or, neither for music, nor poetry, nor the plastic arts do they, women, possess any real feeling or receptivity. If they affect to do so, it is merely mimicry 
in service of their effort to please. This was written in 1851. Or of Gerald Manley Hopkins, 1878, in a letter, and his observation that, and I quote him, the main quality of the artist is masterly execution, which is a kind of male gift, and especially marks off men from women, the begetting of one's thought on paper, on verse, or whatever the matter is. On better consideration, it strikes me that the mastery I speak of is not so much in the mind as a puberty in the life of that quality. The male quality is the creative gift. Under this architecture of patriarchy, I mean, we all know these things, but I think it's also good, you know, to remind ourselves that this has been written, and it's terrible. So under this architecture of patriarchy, it has always been harder for women to articulate the issues of creativity and writing with those of motherhood and domesticity. I quote two poems, very short ones of mine, that seem to illustrate that difficulty. At the, same, at the same time, it is precisely that difficulty that becomes the inspiration for the poem. The first one is called Visitations, or a supposedly gently, gentle poem. Sorry, Visitations, or a supposedly gentle poem. She entered very gently, my daughter. The dawn entered with her, but not quite as gently. Her bare feet made less noise than my pencil on the page, but her laughter was louder than my poem. She climbed very gently onto my lap. The poem, like her, came creeping in, but not quite as gently, not with the same gentle urgency. Like a furtive thief, my daughter stole my inspiration, those lines almost finished, almost mine. And here she fell, gently asleep, happy with her crime. The second poem is titled Crescent Moon. Because you see, a moon like this isn't even a moon. The moon should be big, milky white, worth pointing out to children. Look at the man in the moon, his eyes, his broom. But a moon like this, dissolving into shadows, with the air of someone who hasn't slept all day, isn't a moon at all. So don't ask for the impossible. Don't pretend seriously to demand poems and insights. The poet doesn't use a telescope and isn't going to wake up a child for the sake of a sliver of light. Are we then speaking of human beings as a whole or of men and women as they are seen differently and in an unequal way in the culture we live in? Where does life and art intersect? If the truth of the text is different from the other, the truth of life, it is nonetheless a truth, not a lie. This truth is never free from the hand that writes, no matter how much faking or poetic mask that exists within literary conventions. I think that faking and lying are different things. Could we consider, this is a question I pose, with Christiane Rochefort, that literature written by women is a specific category, not because of biology, but because it is, in a certain sense, the literature of the colonized. I think of myself and of my poetry. Molding or shaping my identity is a myriad, as of all of us, a myriad of identities. I am human, I am European, I am Portuguese. I come from the upper middle class, I am white, I am a teacher, I am a woman. As a woman, I am also a mother. And I am a woman poet who is a mother, perhaps woman poet. The identity or sub-identity, for me, more difficult to define. And although I am a feminist, I do not share the view that we are all sisters. And I ask myself, the fact that I am a female, that I have a woman's name, that I speak sometimes in my poetry about the kitchen, the domestic chores, peace, creme brulee, the things of daily life, or about my daughter, does that allow for readings of my poetry as a feminine poetry as it was, and I use the word feminine on purpose here, as a feminine poetry or as a woman's poetry, which are different things, of course. If when one is speaking about the author as an abstract entity, one distinguishes between empirical author and textual author. Why is it always easier and more common among critics to read the female empirical author and the female textual author as coinciding? I give you an example. Vasco Graça Moura, a Portuguese poet, has sonnets to his 
daughters. No one mentions, I mean, these sonnets are never mentioned by the critics, you know. I mean, it, these are never, this is never connected with Vashkras and Mura's life, you know, as it is usually these poems of mine are usually, you know, connected with my life. And Luis is a feminist, therefore, you know, she writes and blah, 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 all of that. Okay. I'm sorry I lost myself. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, you can see it. So my question, why is it easier, as I was saying, and more common among critics to read the female empirical author and the female textual author as coinciding? And yet, this has been a, a, a trait stressed by some critics. To locate men, never women, to locate some of my poems in a, and the word is feminine, in a feminine universe, forgetting that the feminine is a construction that the kitchen does not necessarily have to do with women, that the expression of abandonment is not prerogative of women, that the daughter to whom I write so many poems is, in my poems, a daughter, but that that might happen by chance, that knitting is a metaphor for poetry, could well be used by a man. On the other hand, this is my problem, you see, I mean, I don't have, as I said, the definite answer to these questions. How many men would feel inspired or interested in writing a poem like, and I quote, grammar and other matters. How are we of time? Fine. My daughter says so many things in her own brilliant grammar. The verbs she misconjugates are not so much suns as whole galaxies. The usual commonplaces expand into broad fields of knowledge, manuals for a world still under construction, determined new stars setting ruthless new courses. She says so many things, my daughter, and still they shine. Were it not for the grammar of things, were it not for her conjugations, far more logical than ours, her virgin semantics would make her whole, a human being growing in still virgin soil. I believe that there is a new psychic emotional and physical geography to be explored, where maybe women feel more at ease. They've always felt more at ease. That new geography doesn't have to exclude the topic of poetic faking, in Fernando Pessoa's words, or of the existence of personae. And the learning of that new ge geography does not need to be at odds with the consciousness that the very possibility of speaking and being heard is also for women as Adrian Rich says, verbal privilege. Let me give you an example, and I quote again. It's a, okay. They say that there are loves beyond the feelings enclosed in time. Perfect moments of touches of laughter, small flavors, or also very small, the clouds. Still an infinite torture. Like cosmic dust, etymologies are coincident. And so it is possible to hold in your hands both heaven and hell. Such is the weight of metamorphosis. This short text, it's only four lines, appears in a book of mine of 2003, so I've been, you know, moving on, um, called The Art of Being a Tiger. And it appears as an epigraph and as having been written by Aldo Matias in 1939. In the presentation of that book in 2003, Rosa Maria Mertello stated, and I quote her, the art of being a tiger, and in verses, the in verses, the other part of the book, uh, are pre preceded by epigraphs, two quotations by Aldo Matias, an author totally unknown to me, but who is, according to what Ana Luisa Amaral told me, of Romanian origin whose texts, so I think, she must have certainly translated if we pay attention to the presence of certain idiosyncrasies that we, the readers of her poetry, can recognize." End quote. In 2005, in an interview, someone asked me, and this interview is published, Aldo Matias, it's Matias, M-A-T-H-I-A-S, Matias, who, so someone asked me, Aldo Matias, who, by the way, you summoned to your writing, says that, and then the person, the interviewer quoted, it is possible to hold in your hands both heaven and hell. Do you think that these are the reverses that your poetry tries to disconnect? So this was a question. Since it was an epigraph, the reading protocol implied that the person who was conducting the interview thought, of course, of Aldo Matias as an autonomous figure, the Romanian writer 
of the mid 20th century. On top of this, there was a date, 1939. On my part, that protocol implied two possibilities, to tell the truth, that is to say, there is no Aldo Matias, or the assumption of the game, and I choose the latter. That is, to the question of the interviewer, I answered, Aldo Matias wrote those words in 1939. And his sentence cannot be detached from its context. Then I continued, you know, in my, with my answer, saying, I mean, quoting Adorno, that in the end of the war, they had said that after Auschwitz, to write poetry was a barbaric act, but also having written later on, it may have been wrong to say that after Auschwitz, you could no longer write poems. And then I continue, if you now think about Aldo Matias' paradox of living both in heaven and in hell, a paradox also developed by William Blake or Emily Dickinson, what I was trying to say by using that epigraph was that, in spite of everything, the poetic word can be an antidote for atrocity. Okay, so this was my answer to the interviewer. A woman, in this case. Now, Aldo Matias was an invention of mine. Even though we had the honors of a biography, he has three pages written. I wrote three pages, you know. Of, and then he wrote one, two, three, eight lines. So two epigraphs, four lines each. He was born in Bucharest on February 12, 1909, in a wealthy family, um, the son of a Jewish father and of a, of a mother of Italian descent. He spent most of his childhood and adolescence between Bucharest and Constanta. He studied ethics and philosophy. He met Eugene Ionesco, Miss Eliad. He was forbidden to teach at the University of Bucharest when Romania became a lie of Nazi Germany. He ran away to Roussillon. He met Samuel Beckett. In 1942, then, with the fall of the Vichy government, he took refuge in London, here, where he died in April 3rd, 1945, shortly to the surrender of Germany. He left the novel unfinished. The novel, I mean, I, I, there was a time when I thought of this last novel, of, you know, <laughs> of uh, the novel that I had that came out last week of, uh, um, of signing it by Aldo Matias. But then I had already said that Aldo Matias didn't exist, so I couldn't do it. <laughs> now, why creating a male heteronym in the 21st century? I am a woman, why to do it? We all know that women did it, right? They had to do it. Oh, in the 20th century, we have a wonderful Portuguese poet, very, I mean, not very well known, uh, unfortunately, Irene Lisboa, as a poet, she wrote under the pseudonym of uh, João Falco. I'm sorry, I called the uh, natronym, it's not, well, a pseudonym, let's call it, I don't know exactly what it is. Anyway, why creating a male name, you know, to sign uh, um, two epigraphs in the 21st century, and why did I create Aldo Matias? I think that, in a way, to give birth to a poem, for me, is a process that can be compared, uh, given, of course, you know, in the immense distances, can be compared to the one of giving birth to a child. But I think of the great Russian woman poet, Marina Svetaiva, who wrote, every verse is a child of love, also adding a destitute bastard slip. I invented Aldo Matia so that his reflections on love might be used twice in two epigraphs in that book, The Art of Being a Tiger. And it's very interesting because that book, The Art of Being a Tiger, is maybe the most biographical book that I have and yet the most encrypted book that I have. I mean, no one can, because it's full of, um, as you know, Claire must know it, you know, it's full of resonances from mythology, Ariadne is there, Theseus is there, but I know who is Ariadne, I know who is Theseus, I know who are all these people. The reader doesn't, of course. So, but I invented Aldo Matias so that his reflections on love might be used twice in two epigraphs in The Art of Being a Tiger. I invented him to legitimate those reflections, exploring a place that was not mine, a time that I had not inhabited, a voice that, according to the reader, did not belong to me. Inscribed in the non-fictionalized space of the epigraph, Aldo Matias holds an authorial independent status. In that regard, his pseudo-citation would never be problematic. And yet, from my point of view, as an empirical author, I recognize myself in those words by Aldo Matias, and I even offer these words a condition of truth 
as important as the one conveyed by poems supposedly autobiographical. Aldo Matias was, at this point, a much better vehicle for me, for the ambivalence I then felt, the possibility of inhabiting both heaven and hell, than, it, there were, than the one that exists in some poems of mine. And yet, Aldo Matias is also me, a part of me and Louisa. Because what is self-representation, I ask, but the presentation of an always possible self, even if that self is deflected or refracted, like the image of a pencil that you put in a glass of water. This is an image that I use sometimes when I go to schools to speak about poetry. In this case, about my poetry, you know, the image that you have refracted. The so-called poetic subject, differently from its empirical subject, historically situated, being always a deconsexualized subject at several levels, intersects the empirical one at other levels. Let me give you another example. My daughter broke a bowl on the floor of the kitchen. And I, who felt like writing about the event, was forced to put aside inspiration and pencil, take up a broom, and sweep the kitchen floor. The kitchen swept of bowl looked different from the kitchen of bowl intact, propitious place to excavate and study archaeological map in a remote future. A bowl of white porcelain with flowers, remains of instant cereal, vacuum-packed, scattered along the floor. They were not grains of wheat from Pompeii, but were respectful cereals anyway, and the bowl, even not being from the Ming dynasty, but from Kaldish, five or ten thousand years from now, ought to possess admirable status. Yet Hecatomb was there, and slipped from tiny hands, the bowl was lost, both to fames and to profits, swept of brooms and of memories, by miserable and cruel wastebasket, blue, in modern plastic, indestructible. It is true that the reader of my poem, The Historic Truth, that's the title of the poem, is led to conclude about the presence of biographical traits. She has a daughter, it is a small daughter, the tiny hands, and to induce a female identity by the presence of the conventionally domestic, the kitchen, the litter basket, etc. Even though I was many times, like in the poem about uh, the crime of the daughter, metaphorically and literally speaking, forced to put aside inspiration and pencil, take up a broom and sweep the kitchen floor, not to do this, you know. So even though I was many times forced to do things like that, the events narrated in this poem do not correspond to a set of palpable truths. That is, never did my daughter broke a bowl in the kitchen, although she broke other things as children do. Neither was there a miserable and cruel waste basket in modern plastic indestructible. Finally, even though my kitchen, as any normal kitchen, has bowls and dishes, the bowl of the poem, unbroken, was never a bowl from Kaldish. I don't have, you know, pottery from Kaldish, which is a kind of typical pottery of Portugal. Thus, its non-belonging to the Ming dynasty was meant solely as a pretext to speak about the passage and impermanence of life, but also about the perennial character of human feelings and emotions. I wasn't then thinking, for example, of Primo Levi. I quote Primo Levi, human memory is a marvelous but fallacious instrument. The memories which lie within us are not carved in stone. Not only do they tend to become erased as years go, but often they change or even increase by incorporating extraneous features. Primo Levi feared, as we know, the erasure of fading out of the collective memory of surely the darkest period of the 20th century, the Holocaust. Remembering is an ethical act. It has an ethical value. And painful memory is sometimes the only relation we have with the dead. But at the same time, like Susan Zontag writes, to remember everything would be unbearable, and the creation of peace cannot do without some forgetfulness. It was about that balance point between the memory that we need to activate and reactivate 
and its partial dissolution in time and contexts, which implies an ethics of adjustment to the world and the acceptance of the future that I wanted to speak. That is, the trace that connected the poem to life was memory and love and the desire of inscription of a different kind of history, perhaps her story, her story, you know, I mean that pun in English, her story in history. A fragment of life, because connected to a certain biographical data, the fact that I do have a daughter, thus a fragment of truth. I make my excuses, saying my daughter needs to sleep, and I lie down beside her, my head, sharing her pillow. Outside, the voices in symphony are shrill violins neatly played. I detach myself from their sounds and struggle to hear something different. Bartok to the others. My daughter sleeps. A sudden hope. Let her not be like me in dissonance with other things and other sounds. A proud, sad Bartok. Nor like them a neatly played, a well-tuned violin. This poem is called Tunes. Yet, it is those fragments or traces that allow for the reader to build an image of me as subject, bridging, as Alicia Ostriker says, the transpersonal and the personal. In that sense, the poem holds its own story, deflected, refracted, as I had said, because it is the story of the poem, but nevertheless inhabiting a porous zone where life webs and flows. This would be a way of bearing witness, of contributing to a kind of genealogy without hierarchies among women, those who have been for centuries destitute, their voices silenced or unheard. I wish it could also be a way of answering to the famous complaint of Elizabeth Barrett Browning, I look everywhere for grandmothers and see none. She wrote grandmothers, but might as well have written mothers, since it was a lack of literary tradition she was grieving for. With those fragments, those traces, I believe that it is possible to build an alliance or a pact that, even if always threatened, may create the precarious breach of connection and reconnection towards and among things and the others. This is how for me, this is how, for me, potatoes and poetry, or onions and poetry, or peas and poetry, are indelibly related. I hope that this happens as well in syllogisms, the poem with which I close my talk. My daughter asked me, what does it mean for life? And I told her it meant forever. I lied, of course. But then the concepts of infinite are different, because she asked afterwards what forever meant, and I could not tell her of parallel universes, of conjunctions or disjunctions of space and time, not even of death. A whole life is until you die, but I knew it was inevitable, the next question, what does it mean to die? So I answered that forever was large like this. I spread wide my arms, distracted her with the game unfinished. At the end of the game, she told me that tomorrow she wanted to stay with me for life. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that um, presentation, which covered such a range of aspects um, of being both a mother and a poet, and the same at the, the, both at the same time, um, and for introducing a new audience to some of your poetry. Um, we have a little bit of time for discussion because we started late, so uh, if anybody would like to ask a question, that is possible. I might not be able to see you. <laughs> I can start off asking um, Anna Louisa about the experience of writing prose since you've just published a novel. Did these same problems, uh, are, they, are, they, are they still uh, relevant? 
But the thing is that, I mean, I, I wrote a novel, but it wasn't supposed to be a novel, you know? Uh, I don't know how to... I, I, I would never call it a novel, that's the thing, you see, because it has poetry mixed as well. Um, it was Maria Velha da Costa who told me this is a novel. And if she said... She would know. Yeah, if she says she's a novel, you know, I said, okay, it's a novel. So I accept it, and it's called novel. It's... Um, it is a novel, but I read one, actually, whatever it is, it does not have characters, you know, it does not have names, for example. It has voice one, voice two. So it's, I think that that register, the poetical register, is still there, you know. Um, it's not a novel in the um, more conventional sense, you know, of the word. Um, but it is different because especially with you know the relation with time the way that you write for example a poem a poem may take a long time to work but still it's um, uh, you know I don't know if you know uh, uh, an Argentinian poet Diana Bellesi she writes something very beautiful I don't know how you call the, the bird colibri how do you call it hummingbird the hummingbird exactly the hummingbird she says po poetry is like a poem is like a hummingbird because it goes um, back and forth, you know, uh, staying in the same position, you know, and it has that capacity, it has that possibility, it holds that possibility. Whereas I think that prose or fiction um, has to be more linear than poetry. For me, you know, even though in my poems there is sometimes a narrative. Mm, mm, register, like for example, the one of the kitchen, etc. You know, it's the the capture of an instant. I think that differentiates for me the writing of poetry from the writing of fiction. Yeah. I'm sure it's fine. Thank you so much for a really wonderful, rich and varied, and it's an enormous feast, your talk, so I'm very grateful indeed. I, I didn't read too many poems, no. No, not, an, not enough poems for those of us who, haven't, who, don't, who don't read Portuguese, and it's our enormous loss. I, I had a sense that you were telling us something about motherhood being a certain kind of practice of love. And I had a sense that you were telling us that one way of understanding poetry is a practice of faking that's different from lying. And I wanted to try to understand also whether motherhood is a practice of faking and poetry is a practice of love. And if motherhood is a practice of faking rather than lying, what is, what is, the, you know, is there a new connection we can make between yeah, poetry and motherhood? Yeah, it's a very interesting point. I, 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 I mean, I did say that um, poetry was a question of faking, a lot of lying. I never thought, you know, that you could also apply that to motherhood. I mean, faking, not lying. Um, in so many ways. Fingir. Yes, in so many ways, I think you could. Yeah. I think you could, yes. Um, I mean, the issue of faking, you know, the poetic faking or the... Uh, fingimento, you know, in Portugal, in Portuguese, uh, the, the word is, is, is Fernando Pessoas, implies, I think it implies the existence always of a certain layer of truth that is never abandoned, you know what I mean? Um, in motherhood as well, you know, in motherhood as well. Um, it can be a matter of faking, for example, if you think about the adjustment um, to the social norms, you know, the way that you have to um, deal with, um, the way that you have to deal, for example, with actually compulsory, with compulsory norms, you know, with what comes from the outside, what, I remember very well, for example, that I, I had to fake that I was feeling um, quite well when I went to the United States, you see. Um, Actually, it was a fake, it was not a lie, to tell you the truth, because I was very, I mean, a part of me was happy to go to the United States, 
but I had to show, in a way, I had to build this kind of image, another image of myself, in order to deal with this, uh, with this idea that I was going to leave my daughter that first time, you know, for three months, you know, that she was going to, to be here alone. Actually, you know, it was a horrible thing because I had to leave two women dealing with her. You see, my, my ex-husband then, he told me, you're only going, otherwise I'll leave. I'm going away. It was pretty horrible, you know. I'm well, actually, the, 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 a year after I divorced, you know, I asked for the divorce. I filed for the divorce. It was me who asked for the divorce. But um, it can be a kind of faking in the sense that, as I said, you know, truth is never uh, um, is never absent. I mean, truth is always present. And then it is as if you build another. It, it is as if. Over the truth, you build another layer. Whereas a lie is a totally different thing, you see? A lie is a totally different thing. I mean, a lie, in a lie, you have actually two realities, you know, totally different. You know, in faking, it's the same reality, and then on that reality, it's. I think it is a process very similar to the one of subversion. Like, you know, the, to subvert is to build a version over another one that which is there, you know. I think that that's what poetic faking is, for example, you know. Or to build a poetic voice or a poetic subject, you see. The tr this interests me a lot, you know. The trace, that trace, in, in fr I didn't know how to say it, the French called biographem. I don't know if you can say this, biographem, biographem in English. Uh, apparently so. Apparently so. From yes, Bart. from Bach, yeah, biography, you see. So that trace of the biographical is always there. There was a time in the 60s, for example, we all know this, right, that um, the death of the author. But I mean, the author is always there. Who wrote that poem, you know? That hand was always there. That arm was always there. That body actually was there, you know? Then also, you know, something very interesting that I would like to have had time to speak about, but I didn't, maybe because I read too many poems, I don't know. Um, but I mean, something interesting would be, for example, the issue of inspiration. How does a woman poet deal with inspiration? I mean, traditionally, conventionally, the muse is female. And, you know, and, um, uh, and that relationship is an heterosexual relationship even at the symbolic level, right? I mean, it's a poet inspired by the muse who writes. <coughs> I believe that it's your own body, you know? I mean, you write with your own body, you know, that women write with their bodies. I think that the inspiration is themselves, you see. Uh, you know, it is within themselves. It's their own body. Um, uh, it's not some exterior, you know, some... A uh, figure coming from the outside that inspires. And when I say her body, I'm not referring only to her biological body. When I say body, I mean the biological body, but also the social, I mean, everything that surrounds her, you see. It would be, yes, her children. It would be, yes, you know, her environment, her house, etc. you know what I mean? Yes. Sorry. I have a question. Just wait a second. I couldn't see. <laughs> Hi. When, when you describe the moment of the ball breaking and when you had to pick up a broom instead of a pen, I think you described, or rather, you captured so well the missed moments of a woman who is a mother when you have to do the practical first and then you leave yourself the second, third, fourth, fifth. <laughs> Thank you very much. I never thought about the approach of between a broom and a pen. You see, but I think it's wonderful. I do. Thank you so much. You know, see, this is how it's very interesting when the reading can enlighten, you know, what one writes. It's wonderful. Thank you very much. Yes, the broom could be a pen. That's true. <laughs>
Uh, you opened with such a wonderful poem, uh, written in a plane, in a sense. Last uh, Testament. Yes, uh, so wonderful. And then the Thank closing you. anecdote, just so gripping and touching to me as well. And I'm wondering if you can articulate a bit more uh, the inspiration that your daughter has been to you uh, and the poet you might have been if she hadn't uh, come yeah. along. Yeah, you know, I'm, I have, as Claire said, I have. Uh, I didn't bring any books of mine with me because I was I wanted to travel very light. But I have um, 13 books of poetry, and m m m I have a collection of poems in a book which is, what, 600 pages. I mean, just, I'm not saying this, I'm just say, saying this because um, I have, must have something like 12 poems or 15 the most to my daughter. You know, I, I that's an interesting thing. About you know, I think that that's an interesting thing. You see, this is, when I say this is a trait uh, stressed by many critics, you know, it's very interesting, you know, because I don't have that many poems, you know, written to my daughter. Um, or, or, although she is practically, I mean, until 2002, 2003, actually, no, 2006. I'm sorry, more or less. She is in, 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 in all my books. In fact, I have the historic truth, the one about the bowl. You see, um, you have a historic truth in a poem in a book of 1990, and then I have another poem of 1998 called "Other Truths," "Outras Verdades." You see, which is a dialogue with the historic truth. So it is written. 17 years after, you know, that first poem. Uh, and it starts by saying, my daughter does not break bowls in the kitchen anymore, <laughs> you see, but she does other things. And it's, it's, it's um, like everything, I, I think that everything is inspirational in a way. You know, everything can be inspirational. I don't think that there are major themes and minor themes. And um, as for my daughter, Yes, I think that she is the person that I mostly love in, in all my life, you see. It's my, 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 it's, I have never loved anyone as much as I love her. Therefore, she's there, you know, she has, um, and she's a one, Claire knows her, she's a wonderful human being. I have, I don't know what I did, but I don't, sometimes I say, how did I ever deserve to have this wonderful human being, but she is a human being, one, a hu wonderful human being, and she has, um, even though, you know, some of my poems are not directly, I'm sorry, even though most of my poems are not directed or addressed to her as these, which I have read, or most of these that I have read, um, she has made me, uh, and the way, that I look at things, the way that I relate to things um, has also been highly influenced by educating her, you know. If you can use that expression, educating Rita, by, uh, I have learned so much from her. That poem about grammar, you know, grammatical, uh, grammar matters, whatever, you know. It's about, I don't know if, if you know, if any of you knows Portuguese, um, no one, but what would, yeah, what would be, for example, you know, the equivalent in English to eu ovo muito bem, eu ouço, eu ovo. You know what I mean? Children. Yeah, the conjugating verbs. Yeah, the conjugating right? verbs, you know. I when it is. Or, like, rather than I, I saw, I seen, or I saw. Yes, I saw it, for example, you see, instead of, of, of I've seen, you know, this kind of thing. It's much more logical. We have the verb ouvir, that means to listen. And that poem was written after she had said, eu ouvo muito bem. It's much more logical to say, eu ouvo, than eu ouço. It doesn't make any sense, you know, why eu ouço. I mean, children do these things, you know. So it's, yes, it's as if a whole galaxy opens up. Um, when a child is desired, you know, um, when a child is wanted, you know, and um, she has been a source of inspiration. Also, also, even, even strangely enough, or curiously enough, even when I complain about the interruption, I could also have talked about that, the famous interruption, poetic interruption of Coleridge, for example, 
right? Coleridge complains in, in poetic tradition, in poetic theory, the issue of, in, of, in, of, of inspiration, of, of interruption, is fundamental, as we know, right? It starts with Coleridge being interrupted and Kublai Khan having stayed an unfinished poem because someone knocked at his door and he couldn't finish the poem. Here, it was a daughter, you know, who came onto my lap, but the poem was finished, you see. The poem was finished. I think this is an appropriate moment to interrupt, I'm afraid. Yes, yes. Because it's time, and, and a wonderful moment to stop because of talking of galaxies opening up um, and um, love for mo of mo her mother for her daughter and, and of the daughter for her mother uh, is a wonderful way to, for us to start thinking about the rest of the conference. So um, I believe it's, it's um, a tea break now. Yes. A shortish short tea break. Yes. And we'll, three, um, and we'll be starting again at half past three, hopefully. So if you, if you would like to have a cup of tea or um, another drink, take it with you to the next session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.